Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Art Matters talk with the Clustered Spires Quilt Guild. I'm Kristen Butler, Director of Programs here at the Delaplane Art Center. Before I hand things over to our exhibitions manager, Corey Fry, I wanted to mention that if you enjoy our programs, exhibitions, and classes and workshops, consider supporting us by becoming a member. Members get a lot of great benefits, including discounts on classes and workshops. You can find more information on our website. And now, Delaplane Exhibitions Manager, Corey Fry. Hi, everybody. So glad you guys are with us. Um, we're really excited about our talk today. I want to encourage you first about a couple of things. We have, there's four new exhibitions opening at the Delaplane today. Um, there are paintings by Maremi Andriazzi. Uh, there's photography by the Frederick Camera Click. We have some paintings on our second floor by uh, Ken Bachman, oil on oil paintings. Um, we have a continued exhibition that's still running from last month by Michael Hunter Thompson, and those are photographs as well. And last but not least, we have um, the uh, Clustered Spires Quilt Guild who's with us today talking with us. So I want to just invite you all out. We, we are open. Um, we do ask that folks wear face masks and we're implementing social distancing, but we're open um, and we'd love to have you come out. We got a lot of space uh, in our galleries and so you can, you can do pretty good at keeping distant from one another and being safe. So if you aren't able to make it out, if you're at a distance or you just don't feel safe, we totally understand. And we have provided uh, virtual exhibitions of all of our exhibitions at the Della Plain, and you can find links for those at our website on our exhibitions page. It's a great way to still check out things even from a distance. You can zoom in and see details and everything, so it's, it's great. Um, so check that out as well. I want to read just a quick bio about the Clustered Spires Quilt Guild and their, uh, their exhibition is entitled Trees, so it's all tree themed, mostly tree themed work. Um, but the Cluster Spires Quilt Guild was founded in 1999, and they welcome quilters of all skill levels as they advance their mastery of working with fiber. Trees give a nod to many quilts and quilters that are rooted in the group's past and which have led to the varied works they create today. So today we have, um, we have four of our quilters from the Cluster Spires Quilt Guild that'll be sharing with us. And we're so glad to have them here. They are Danita Frisbee, uh, Brenda Barnhart, Olga Schrichta, and Joan Watkins. Thank you all so much for being here. Hi, I'm Danita Frisbee and I'm the current president of the Cluster Spires Quilt Guild here in Frederick. Uh, unusual times, we may uh, we meet uh, every second Thursday, except for the month of July at the Delaplane, and uh, we socialize and we have snacks, and we share our new quilted projects, and we have speakers who speak on a variety of uh, quilting and fiber arts topics, but. Uh, we haven't been able to meet physically for several months now, but we haven't missed a beat. We do our meetings via Zoom and we've had some wonderful speakers and we still get to share our projects with each other. The biggest difference is, is if you want a snack, well, you're just gonna have to provide that for yourself. Well, the, the Quilt Bit Guild's been around for about 21 years and it was established to promote um, education and uh, phil philanthropic, uh, uh, endeavors through quilting and fiber arts. And a large component of our quilt guild is our community service. So this year, despite logistics challenges, we contributed 46 quilts to a local organization, uh, Children of Incarcerated Parents. We made innumerable masks and other PPE for our local um, healthcare workers and for other people in our community. And we donated squares to the National uh, Quilts of Valor campaign, which um, provides quilts to veterans, to honor veterans. 
So you don't have to be an expert quilter to join the guild. Uh, we have, actually we have some national prize winners in our guild, but we also have a lot of people who just don't really quilt much at all. We have old timers and newbies. And so everyone is welcome. Part of, part of the joy of being able to share tips and tricks with each other is to challenge ourselves to make something that we can cherish or we can give away. Now I've been quilting for about 20 years and I have several uh, quilts in the show today. Um, since the overall theme is trees, I'll start with my tree quilt that I made for the challenge. This is bottle tree. And you may or may not know that a bottle tree is a tree that you put bottles on, usually upside down, like in the, in the picture, and they catch bad spirits. So you put them by your door or by a gate so that they'll catch the bad spirits and keep them there. And so they won't enter your property or your house. So uh, I found um, a picture of a bottle tree that I liked online and I drew, drew from it and made the pattern and quilted this. It's uh, needle turn applique, which means each piece is cut out and the edges are turned under as you sew them onto the background. And then I added embroidery and uh, actually um, some highlights and shadows with crayons. So uh, that was my challenge quilt. Um, Brenda will talk to us about cha uh, the challenge quilts in just a, a moment. The next quilt is also a tree. This is a needle turned applique. This is a, a tree that I saw when I was taking a walk on the CNO Canal and I was intrigued by the hole in the tree that you could just see right through to the sky. So I took some photographs and I, then I drew it out and, and made the pattern and uh, added the colorful leaves so that it has a little bit of whimsy in there. Um, it's machine uh, quilted on my home machine. The, the next quilt I have is called Woodland Medley and it's out one of our blocks of the month. In our guild, we often have a block of the month project where you can uh, make one block each month and then at the end of the year, you put them together and make a quilt. And this year we had um, uh, these blocks that were in Sunday Best Quilts by Sherry McConnell and Corey Yoder. Um, my daughter had given me a whole pack of coordinating fabrics and I added a few more so that I could make this uh, quilt and it's got, uh, uh, it's a little hard to see, but it's got birds and leaves featured all throughout the quilt. Uh, my next quilt doesn't have anything to do with trees at all, but it does have some flowers. This is called Chicks in the Garden. And it was a pattern from a magazine that I really liked. What I really liked about the, the pattern was that it had silk flowers embroidered on it. So then I made the quilt and I started to do the silk flower embroidery when I realized that the ribbon was not gonna go through the tightly woven cotton. So I couldn't do that. And so I just embroidered the flowers by hand and, and I, I liked it pretty well. I really think that on the magazine, even though they didn't indicate it, they must have made or purchased silk flowers and sewed them on their quilt because there would be no way that you could do that embroidery on the quilt. Um, this is a table runner and it's um, hand quilted. And then my last quilt is called Second Line and it's actually a challenge quilt from last year. We had to, uh, take a state flag and then make a quilt that represented something in that state using colors that were in the flag. And my state flag is from Louisiana, which is where I lived before moving to Maryland. And this is second line, which is the line of musicians and uh, dancers that follow the mourners at a New Orleans funeral. And so it's usually uh, nice jazz music and people dancing in the street behind a funeral procession. So I think that it represented New Orleans. Um, and it was a lot of fun. It's a raw edged applique, which means I didn't turn over the edges when I was making them, but it's machine quilted um, on my home machine. And so 
I, I have such a variety of quilts and I just, uh, I like to show that you can find inspiration in many places and express yourself in a wide variety of techniques and style. And it's a lot of fun. So I'll pass it on to Brenda who will talk about our challenge quilts. Hi there. Um, our guild does a challenge every year. And uh, some of the recent themes that we've done were um, several years ago, we presented everybody with a seed packet and they may need to make a quilt or a project based on that seed packet or the colors, the, the plant, uh, whatever it was that they wanted to take from that as inspiration. It didn't need to be a literal seed packet. Um, then we did a, a black and white plus one color challenge a few years ago. And um, that was very interesting. And black and white is so dramatic that adding another color to it really uh, makes it pop and you get some wonderful results. Uh, a few years back, we did a Halloween theme um, because uh, our challenge concludes in October. And uh, so we had a lot of uh, interesting and fun Halloween uh, themed quilts and other projects. Ladies will sometimes make uh, jackets or tote bags or just uh, any possible combination of uh, fiber arts that you can imagine. Uh, as Danita mentioned, we did uh, something uh, based on a state last year. Um, it could be something about the state. It could be the colors of the state flag. It did require that you use the color of the state flag. Um, and ladies did things like their home state, uh, the retirement state, uh, the states that they traveled through throughout their lives. It didn't have to be just one state, but it had to represent at least one state in some way. And then this year, our committee chose to make the challenge trees. Uh, trees are so essential to our world and to our lives. And uh, so um, it could represent one tree or multiple trees or just something that was suggested by trees. And that's where the challenge comes in and the imagination of our, our quilters. Uh, the challenge yielded uh, nine entries this year. Um, you know, we did have the, uh, the quarantine, which gave us more time in one respect, but in another respect, uh, it just kind of threw everybody's schedule and mindset into uh, an upheaval. So we only had nine this year and you'll be seeing all of those in the show and a couple of them in this show or in this presentation. The only requirements were that they had to be um, made of a quilt top, which is the front, the batting, which is the middle layer and a backing. And the dimensions had to be 25, 24 inches wide and they, the length could be a maximum of 36 or less. Um, so that kind of kept them a little more um, consistent as far as the sizes and shapes went uh, to make it the theme of this, uh, this show this year. All of the, qu the quilts in this show are not from the challenge, but you will see other quilts in this uh, show that uh, are a tree theme. They just weren't part of the challenge this year. The first one that you see here was our first place winner. Um, we award three prizes and this was the first place winner. It was made by Marsha Walker and it's called Hope. It represents the aftermath of fires in Yosemite Park in the 90s when she was there and the new growth that it spawned. And it was a very timely quilt uh, based on um, the horrible fires that we've been having out West in uh, the country this year. Um, so it was, uh, this was the first uh, time Marsha had entered the challenge and she was hesitant to even do so, but she decided at the last minute to do it and she won first place. So I always like to see somebody who hasn't won before win. Um, and then they can stop saying that I never win anything. The second one, we had a uh, tie for second place this year. Um, and this first one on the left is um, Dot White's uh, tie-dyed quilt called Looking Up. It was made from watching a Ricky Tim's video and she used freezer paper for the guidelines. Uh, Ricky Tim's is an international quilting author, teaching award-winning quilter. He's a fabric designer and a musician. Um, he has been to Frederick to do a workshop in the past 
and uh, he is very entertaining and he and his fabrics and his designs are all very um, colorful and freeform and uh, exciting. Um, and hand dyed and um, um, ballet are kind of interchangeable and they're just fabrics that are dyed by hand. They're often bright colors and uh, often will have patterns um, that are stamped on them or are um, created by twisting or tying the fabrics and then dyeing them like you would do a tie dyed t-shirt. The third one on the right is um, Darlene Morris who also tied for second place. This she made from a photo of a stamp by Linda Edwards that had a tea theme. And on the, uh, the quilt, she has uh, dimensional objects. Her flowers are 3D. Um, she has um, little things, uh, cupcakes and food and, and just wonderful little charming things that were inspired by um, her tree, her tea. And the sign under its, or the words on the bottom say, meet under the tree for a nice cup of tea. The next uh, six quilts were also presented. We have Danita's and she's already talked about that um, with her needle turned hand applique. Danita does a lot of appliqueing. Sometimes um, it's done by machine with like zigzagging raw edges. And sometimes, um, you might uh, make a, a shape that you turn under, say over freezer paper or a plastic template or something. But in this case, Danita, she just used a needle to tuck in the edges of her fabric as she uh, continued to hand applique down her shapes. The next one is, um, next to it is Fran Schur's tree, another tree that um, was in the challenge and you'll see in the gallery. It was created from a childhood memory of a dead beech tree that she has named Rebirth, showing a sapling that's raw edge applique. This one, as I talked about, the applique is raw edge. And that's when you just cut out your shapes. Um, you can um, glue them down uh, to the fabric or not, and then uh, you sew them down um, with either um, a zigzag or a quilting stitch, um, something to hold it down. But it's called raw edge because you don't tuck in the edges the way that Danita did it. And again, her, cre her tree shows some hope for the future with the sapling, um, which is the beautiful thing about trees. The next one is Joan Watkins' uh, tree as well for the challenge called Dogwood. And uh, Joan will talk about it more in this presentation coming up. Um, she did it on a background um, that is a commercial variegated print. Uh, she didn't paint it and it's not pieced from other fabrics. And um, the background reminded her of lace. And so she decided um, to use actual lace for the foliage on the tree. Um, and then she has a Sashiko sewing machine, which she used to quilt it, which does um, some interesting stitches. I'll talk about Sashiko when we get to my presentation, of my quilts. But the tree is actually, like I say, lace. When you get up close to it, you'll see that. The next slide is uh, on the left is Julie Howell's quilt. And it's based on a Smokey the Bear poem from her childhood in Montana. She used buttons and cut fabric flowers. Again, it's 3D relief. And the middle section is more heavily batted to give the tree some texture. In the middle, we have Nancy Speck's tree quilt, uh, wall quilt called Trees 4. Um, Nancy is famous for making uh, tree quilts. She really likes them and she likes to make quilts to uh, reflect the holidays at the time. So this is her fourth one. And it's a uh, Christmas tree collage uh, with scalloped edges. And uh, she has ribbons attached to the packages beneath the tree. And on the right, the final one of the challenge is Kathy Shankle's Moon Over the Tree. And it was inspired by a Washington Post calendar photo. She used Swarovski crystals for the stars in the sky and ruby colored ones for the leaves. And when you get to see this, you'll see the sparkle um, that shows up a lot better in person than it does on uh, a slide. It's called the light of the silvery moon. 
also you'll see in the background the quilting that she did, which has stars in it and other ocean waves and other sorts of um, shapes that um, make it very interesting and make it sparkle like the light of a night sky. Starting on the next three slides are the quilts that I have in the show, um, which are not related to the challenge, but this one, ironically, is a tree. I did it um, back in 2007 in a workshop with one of our guild members named Jody Barker. It's a 20 inch square and the center is whole cloth. Uh, we use the term whole cloth when you do a design on a single piece of cloth. And the intention is to feature the stitching as opposed to the fabrics and the colors and the designs of pieced quilts. Um, it's, the tree is a trapunto method of making it stand out and look like a tree without any outline being drawn on it. Trapunto is Italian meaning to quilt and it's also called a stuffing technique. The puffy decorative feature utilizes at least two layers, the underside of which is slit and padded and produces a raised surface on the quilt. This one has a new technique where you sew the tree outline with the padding attached using melt away thread. And then you cut around the outside and remove that when you're done. Then you attach it to a backing again and you stitch the tree outline with regular thread again around your back, around your shape. And then you soak the fabric, which dissolves the temporary threads and you no longer see them. This leaves a raised design. The next slide is Dianthus Folded Flowers. This was, is a 15 inch square wall quilt. And it's a class that I took in 2006 in Gaithersburg with Judy Lundberg. It's a pattern from the book Fab Fabled Flowers by Kumiko Sudo. The flower stems were machine appliqued and the flowers are folded using bright contemporary prints like origami. I hand stitch a sashiko pattern in the sky and on the bottom ground using variegated embroidery threads. Sashiko is a type of Japanese embroidery for decorative and reinforcement stitching. And uh, as opposed to trying to make small stitches so that you can't see the stitching uh, is done by hand, which is a fine art in of itself. Sashiko is meant to be see, have the stitches be seen. So they're generally done with heavier threads and the stitches are spread further apart. And my final entry for the show is an homage to Diane S. Heyer and Lal Birch. This was from a 2008 Guild workshop with Diane a quilting artist, teacher, and lecturer from Maine. It's a 20 inch square. The inner foundation is a nine block square of various bally fabrics. Then brightly colored organdy ribbons are crisscrossed over the block and satin stitched down along the edges. The outer border is a Law Birch cat print that I love. The free motion quilted, I free motion quilted the outlines of the cats which you'll be able to see better in person. And I chose a black and white stripe for the inner and the binding, the inner border and the binding. Again, as I said before, black and white tend to set off colors that make, just makes them look brighter. Laura Birch was a notable American artist and designer who only lived to be 62. She passed away in 2007. And coming up next is Olga Schrichter. Thank you. Hello. I've been a member of Clustered Spires Quilt Guild since 2000. Uh, I've been sewing as long as I can remember, but I just started quilting in 1997. I'm pretty much a self-taught quilter, and I wouldn't call myself a traditional piecer or quilter. I'm more of an art quilter. I love to experiment and find out what happens when you combine different techniques. So I'm always trying new and different things. In 2010, I purchased a Gamma long arm quilting machine with a Statler stitcher. 
And this is simply a computer assisted software program, which allows me to quilt very intricate digitized patterns, or I have the capability of dropping the belts and doing hand guided quilting, which I think I have the best of both worlds. I love what quilting brings to a quilt top. As one of my clients said, it animates them. It literally brings them to life. And I love experimenting with different kinds of batting to achieve the desired results. I think of quilting as the frosting on a cake. Now you wouldn't put the same frosting on every single cake that you make. So you shouldn't use the same batting. You should always experiment to see if you're getting the desired effect. This Dream Big Leaf panel is a panel by Hoffman Fabrics, and it was not in the tree challenge. It is separate. For this, I thought I was going to use a set of patterns digitized by Nancy Hackey, but as it turned out, I just used her patterns in the center. After that, I looked at the beautiful markings on the leaves, the different veins, and I decided that I wanted to do my own thing. So I dropped the belts and I hand guided all the stitching. Uh, in the second ring around the center, I, it, you can see the curved veins around the leaves. After that, I wanted to have some contrast. So I put the circles or the pebbles, and then I kept on working out from there, getting my inspiration from the leaves, or if I couldn't do it that way, then I tried to quilt something that would be a contrast to make the other stand out. Um, for this quilt, I did use two layers of batting. I used 80% cotton, 20% polyester underneath, and the wool batting on top. And I like that it adds a lot of structure. The quilt looks more like a canvas rather than just a quilt. And that's the effect that I wanted from this quilt. My second quilt is called Moroccan Vibes. And this was my first experiment using a, special, a specialty ruler called a quick curve ruler. And the pattern came from one wonderful curve. Um, I, as I said, I'm not a traditional piecer, but I was very pleased with the results on how easy it was to make these curves and how beautiful they looked. For uh, the one change that I made was that I added the red border around the quilt because I thought it needed to be framed. I didn't like the way it looked when it just ended with the piecing. For the quilting, I used the set of patterns designed by Nancy Hackey. I loved the strong radiating lines in the background fabric and how they contrasted with the beautiful full feathers on the inside on the print fabrics. The red border, you can't see it here, but you'll be able to see it at the show. I quilted it with a diamond and pearl motif. And then for the binding, I used one of my very favorite techniques, and that is to use what's called a faux piped binding. It's where you can see just an eighth of an inch of an accent color before you see the dark brown binding fabric. And I was very pleased with how this one turned out. For this one too, I used two layers of batting, and you're going to see that it's, it's very substantive and it, it stands nicely on its own. For my last quilt, this is my crayon challenge that I made in 2018. And this won first place in our guilds challenge that year. I had so much fun making this quilt because I got to pull out all the stops and experiment with everything. The first thing I experimented with was treating the background fabric so it would be more like a canvas than a soft cotton fabric. So I coated it with a layer of gesso and it was really a very thick layer. So it was more like a canvas. Next, I decided to draw the desk. I had just taken a drawing class at FCC. So I decided to put those talents to good work. And so I drew the desk and then I painted the background with um, uh, paint sticks and water. And after that, it was time to create 
the flowers. Now for this challenge, we were presented with an envelope that had three crayons in it. And our challenge was to create a quilt using those colors and recognizable amounts. In the photo on the left, you'll see how I thought I was going to do my challenge. I used what's called drapery blackout fabric for the flowers. And the reason I chose that is you can cut that fabric out and it won't ravel. And that's the effect I wanted. Now to make my flowers, I pressed the fabric, I got it nice and hot, and I melted the crayons directly on the fabric. And I just created wide swaths of color. In some instances, I kept the colors <clears throat> pure. And you'll see that in others, I, I mixed and blended the colors. So I got more than just the three colors shown there. I abandoned the first plan and decided to make a bouquet of flowers. So after I made my flowers, it was time to move on to the foliage. And for that, I used a variety of batik and regular cotton prints that were just raw edge applique down. I didn't even use a glue with them because I wanted them to have um, a third dimension to them. I used uh, thread painting and raw edge applique to secure them down. And then my next decision is what kind of uh, vessel did I want to put them in? I decided I didn't want a vase. I thought it would be neat to experiment having a mason jar. So the first thing I did was creating a teeny line of bubbles about halfway down in the jar to make it look like a water line. And then to create the look of glass, I took a light blue piece of tulle and placed it on top and I stitched that down. The last accent piece that I added was the butterfly and I left the wings so they could just uh, float in the air. And then for this quilt, I decided to use a very wide binding. I selected a kaleidoscope print that I thought mimicked the colors I had used in my bouquet. And I was really happy with the way this one turned out. You'll see on the right, the work in progress. You can see how it, the fabric almost looked like a canvas before it was attached. And um, I find it fun to go back. I take a lot of pictures of my work in progress and I like doing that to document how a piece has progressed. And now you're gonna hear from Joan Watkins. Hi, I'm Joan Watkins. And let me start by saying Olga neglected to say that she recently won a national uh, award for that crayon challenge quilt and the beautiful flowers. So we, we're all, we all know her now that she's famous. Very nice. This quilt um, I've called Balance. It was a group quilt where I made the centerpiece, the square with the circle on it. And then uh, uh, my friend Helen did the border that pretty much blends with it, but adds a nice purple pop around it. And then Julie Howell did the, the applique border around the outside. Uh, to finish it off, I followed the shape of Julie's um, stem that she has going around the quilt. And I put it, mounted it on a belt backing and batting. I didn't use traditional batting in this. It's, it's all felt and it was, I think it gave a really nice effect. It stayed nice and flat um, and the color of the felt just worked so well with the colors in the quilt. So the next one is my tree quilt for the challenge. I've always loved dogwood trees. And when I drive around in the springtime, I look at the dogwood trees and they always remind me of lace. And so I decided I wanted to do a dogwood tree made from lace. And since I couldn't find the exact kind of lace I wanted, I made the, the lace on my embroidery machine. And then I uh, stitched that down onto the tree, which I had thread painted onto the background. And uh, I think it all worked together really nicely. It is a commercial background. It looks like a hand painted background. And uh, 
in the future, if I can't find a background that I like, I know that I could paint something similar to that to make it work. The quilting, uh, Brenda mentioned that I have a Sashiko machine that I used for that. And it worked very nicely. It shows the, the stitching on the front like as if it were a hand quilted stitch. And I like that effect very much, especially since I don't do any hand quilting. My next quilt is a, a portrait of my mother. I started with a photograph from earlier years. I don't remember, I don't know exactly how old she was when this picture was taken, but it shows her in a very healthy way. So I call it in the pink. And she loved that fuchsia color of the blouse. I started with a photograph, traced off the shapes to get the colors and the, uh, the shadows to make it work using uh, pink fabrics from my collection and that of a friend. Then I thread painted to, to get all the detail on there, uh, to get the, the texture and the shadowing and, and uh, in her hair. I've got a lot of, of thread in the hair as well. The blouse is uh, one that I made for her and the necklace is hers and the jewelry on the side was a, a a pin that I made for her many, many years ago. So it's a, a really good memory quilt for me. The next one is a portrait of my dad. This was the first portrait quilt that I made. I started working on that a few weeks before he died. I didn't realize that he would be dying that soon, but it turned out to be a really good project to help me through that process. And again, I started with a photograph. I traced off the elements to get the, the shadows. I did not try to be realistic in the colors. In fact, the, the purple color works out in, in a, a very subjective way because he had memory problems, he had dementia and purple is the color for Alzheimer's and dementia. So I, I like that connection. The uh, shirts are from his own clothing. And the next, uh, the next slide, I show the thread painting process a little bit. When I started the, with my picture making the head, very plain. And I think he looks pretty young in that picture actually, even though he was 95. Each day as I did some thread painting, it seemed like the, the character developed and the age, it, it really changed before my eyes each day as I worked on it. And I think that the, the thread really adds so much to getting the real character in the picture. The, the next slide will show again, the finished piece. And I think that really shows how, how all of that works together, the color, the texture, the thread, and then mounted on a, a nice background that bring, lets everything, bring, all the colors shine there. The next slide shows the back of the quilt. And this is something that we often forget to do, documenting our work. This shows the, the photograph that I started with, the name of the quilt, my name, where I live. Um, it tells, it gives credit to the original photographer, the dates there, all of the information that I wanted to say, the, the important who, what, where. The background fabric is uh, pictures of, carpentry and woodworking and things like that. My dad was a uh, cabinet maker and a toy maker. 
And so the fabric has a lot of the elements from his lifetime and that was important to me. I thought it was a really relevant backing to the, to the quilt. And then there's a piece of a tie that has all of his children's names on it, probably something someone had made for him for Father's Day or Christmas one year, but a, a little another personal piece of his life. So now I'm going to turn this back over to Olga and she's going to tell us about the next quilt. This is my Spires and Frederick quilt that I made in 2015 as part of a challenge for one of the quilt bees I belong to. Uh, what inspired me was our trip to Frederick in 2000 when we came to look for our house. And I had just come from dreary England and I was so impressed with the brilliant blue skies and the riot of colors in the foliage. And of course, then I was mesmerized by the spires of Frederick. So when the challenge came up, it was what Marilyn means to me. I said, I wanna take Frederick. And this is the way I depict, depicted Frederick. Uh, the fabrics are printed fabrics. The sky fabric was printed, the foliage, was also printed, but I don't know if you can tell the uh, foliage in the front has a lot of orange and reds in it. And for that, I used ink tense pencils just to color and to use aloe vera gel to intensify the colors. I also did the same thing on the branch that's hanging over the sky to bring out those colors. I mostly did hand guided quilting and thread painting on it, but I also used a digitized um, quilt pattern for the sky and for the borders. Clustered Spires had note cards printed up with this design uh, and we continued to sell these as, um, as a fundraiser. So it was a lot of fun creating this quilt and it's probably one of the favorite ones that I've done. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, man, that was, it was so fascinating, the whole thing. I mean, I've, I've spent some time in the gallery with you guys' work uh, as, as we've been preparing for the opening of the exhibition and your, your care and your dedication is absolutely apparent just in seeing the work. But then hearing you guys talk about it, it's just, it, it adds another layer of complexity that's, that's really interesting. And so thank you guys so much for sharing. Um, I'm going to see if I can catch up here on the side and see if we have any questions from anyone. Um, let's see here. It doesn't look like any questions have come through. I have a question though about, um, you know, not being aware of some of the terminology that you guys use and that sort of thing. I was really interested in the idea of thread painting. When you when you say thread painting, are you saying that you are using a specific color thread in order to add that uh, layer of color to the fabric? Pretty much. Yeah. Because I, I have an extensive thread collection and I bet everybody else does too. <laughs> so we use we use the color of uh, the sheen, sometimes metallic threads, different fibers and and put them on in a in a different density or maybe using different stitches to come up with different patterns and intensities and uh, getting the texture and the color yeah. it works for both of those texture and color yeah it's so <laughs> really interesting to me how like it it's sort of two worlds like it's sculptural in a certain way Yes, but on a two dimensional surface. And so it's really interesting to think about a, a three dimensional object like thread and even fabric being used as as a painting technique. I just I really like that idea. That's super interesting to me. Mm -hmm. yeah, if you think about it as using even colored pencils, um, where you start with one color and then you come in with another at a different angle on top, you just keep building that depth and those values. And it's, 
it's really interesting what you can what you can do with it. It just mm. it adds a lot to the quilts. Oh yeah. yeah. That's great. And heaven forbid you have to pick any of it out. <laughs> that oh, no. takes a while. You you can spend you can spend 20 minutes putting a layer of color on and then you decide, oh, it doesn't work and it takes hours to get it out. Oh my goodness. I can't imagine. <laughs> Cannot imagine. I've we've been as we've been working on the exhibition. And I think I was telling you all earlier, it's it's so interesting being in the room with all the work because you can you feel the fact that there are hundreds and hundreds of hours of of tedious and patient filled work just surrounding you on all sides. And so um, and so it's such a it's such a neat experience being in, in the room with all the work. Um, if anyone has any other questions that come through, uh, you guys can you guys can submit your questions in the chat uh, if you're if you have anything. I want to ask one other thing really quick. If somebody's interested in joining the Clustered Spires Quilt Guild, how how would they go about doing that, and where can maybe they find out more information about you guys? They can visit our website, the Clustered Spires Quilt Guild website and uh, they can email and I can answer the email. They're welcome to visit one of our virtual meetings since we're not having physical meetings um, and they can sample it and then uh, hopefully join. Uh, they'll be directed to our um, membership committee and they can join and have all of the benefits of all of our lovely speakers and all of our tips and tricks and uh, show and tell. Hmm. Yeah, that's so great. I think you can see from the quilts the diversity of our quilters, which is what makes it so wonderful. You know, you get uh, new quilters or soon to be or thinking about it quilters who uh, are so intimidated often. And they say, well, you know, if I come to that guild, they're all going to be experts and I'm going to be really embarrassed. And I try to convince them that Quilters love to share the art. We love to share um, our time, our materials um, uh, with other people and get them started, inspire them. And uh, it's a really wonderful thing. And it's very social too. Uh, gosh, we sure miss our meetings at the Delaplane Center. Um, it's painful, but at least now with Zoom, we're able to get together and see each other's faces and, and what we're working on. We do show and tell at our meetings every month to show what we've been working on. And uh, so we're continuing in that way. Um, but we have everything from, you know, the traditional quilters uh, to the modern art quilters. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of quilts are even just uh, fiber sculptures, uh, as you mentioned. Um, uh, I, did, I did some fabric uh, types of things when I was in college that were not quilts, that kind of, uh, caused me to migrate. You know, I think all of us, or most of us come from a sewing background, you know, from school and making clothes and aprons and gifts and things. And uh, so it kind of uh, evolved into doing quilts. And many of us still do the other things in addition to that, uh, mm -hmm. which is where our talents really came into play for making face masks and uh, mm -hmm. hospital gowns and things like that. Uh, we're happy to do that and contribute to the community. And uh, a lot of those items were shipped around the country too to people that we knew or that contacted us that they they had a need for it. So we were really happy to do that and uh, use up some of our downtime. So we do have a website. We also are on Facebook and uh, it'll have our contact information in there. And if you do become a member, we have a lovely monthly newsletter that Brenda puts out for us. And it's uh, colorful and has great information in it. So you would be able to enjoy that if you become a member of the, of the guild. That's so great. Well, is there, do you guys have anything else that you wanted to share? Any last thoughts before we hop off of here? It doesn't look like any other questions have come through, but. Uh... I was gonna ask if anybody, if you all wanted to ask each other questions. <laughs> I did a chat for Olga online when she uh, had the flowers that she uh, she painted. Um, I was asking her whether she had the border fabric first, which inspired the, the flowers in the center because they were so well coordinated. 
Um, you know, quilters sometimes are inspired by just a piece of fabric mm -hmm. or a line of fabrics. A lot of designers will do a whole line of fabrics um, that are coordinated. Sometimes it's inspired by a photograph, uh, something they see. Um, and so um, it's really a, a really creative process. Um, sometimes it's strictly out of your imagination. But I was asking Olga, back to my question to her was that did she was she inspired by the border fabric which was that really wonderful multicolored design which like I say uh just really played well with her center design and she said no it was just a happy coincidence just I didn't discover that until after the fact when it came time to do the binding it was like wow look at this it's funny I bought that fabric not having a clue what I was going to use it for, but I just knew it was one of those fabrics I had to have, you know, if you go home and dream about it, you know, you should have bought it. So I didn't want to be in that boat. So, um, you know, I had it on hand. I, I do have one minor correction and that is, um, it was a different floral um, quilt that I made that won a national award, not this one, but who knows, I may enter this one next year. So we'll see how well it does. But um, I, I love working with the flowers with that raw applique. Uh, the class was taught by a woman named um, Linda Cooper and um, using very little glue because I really like the, the flowers to bloom on the fabric for them to be raised and to have that texture. And she taught us how to achieve that. So it's always fun taking lessons from people and um, learning different different techniques and then experiment and play and what if you know and if you make a mistake oh well it's only fabric but have fun mm -hmm. <laughs> now i'd like i'd like to say since this exhibit is also virtual that challenged me to learn a whole bunch of stuff for getting photographs ready to go on the web and learning how to take the the shots that people sent me which were mostly I believe uh, taken on their phones get them cropped and straightened up and different perspectives so that they would look better on on the website so that was a real challenge a good learning experience and I had a lot of fun doing that. It's always, I think it's always good to meet a challenge and learn something new. Yeah, yeah that's really good. Are any of you, um, are all of you first generation quilters or do you have quilting in your heritage? No, no I actually no. have quilts from my great grandmothers, mm -hmm. my grandmothers and my mother. My mother is 86, she still quilts. So, and a, a great aunt, I have some quilts from a great aunt also. Mm. My have, mother, excuse me. My mother was inspired to make a quilt when I uh, was quilting. Uh, she always liked fish. So she, uh, she decided she wanted to make a fish quilt. And uh, we found a pattern. I used to drag her to all the, the fabric shows and the quilt shows. And uh, she, she'd whiz through them in about 10 minutes and then she'd sit down and wait for me to finish and uh, join her. <laughs> which would be hours later. And so um, I was really excited that we were gonna do this mother daughter thing together. And so we went to the shows and the shops and we bought fabrics for it and talked about it. And uh, so I contacted her and I said, listen, okay, so when do you wanna to get together and we'll start working on it? And she says, oh, it's done. And I said, what do you mean it's done? And she said, well, it's done. And I said, well, you're not serious because I labor over my projects. I think about them a long time. I gather a lot of fabric. Uh, I really, it's a real mental process for me. And she said, no, no, it's all done. And I said, well, you started it without me? And she said, well, yeah, yeah, it's done. So <laughs> I went over, I saw, I saw it over and I thought, I can't believe she did it. You know, it's like, it's only been like a couple of months. So I went over and she had uh, half of the fish upside down. Um, but, uh, she was so proud of it. And, uh, so she put it, you know, she featured it in her house and, and everything. And I had a lot of fun telling everybody how my mother had quilted it and stuff. So that was really, uh, was funny that, uh, we didn't really get to share the process, but she, she's a, she was a go-getter and didn't have a lot of patience for things. So I was really proud of her. That was the extent of her quilting. <laughs> cool. Well, my dad quilted. He made a lot of quilts. Um, oh. uh, 
lots of lap quilts, baby quilts, huge bed quilts. He did, he was, he took that up after he retired. Mm -hmm. um, his mother had been a quilter and he inherited her scraps and he was determined to use them up, but I don't think he did uh, get them all used up. And then of course, a lot, once, you, once you're quilting, other people give you fabric. So it, it just keeps accumulating. <laughs> um, so my dad, my grandmother, uh, my dad's aunt and her, so then her mother, which would have been his great grandmother, you know, it, it goes back some generations, which is pretty, pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And I have sewing machines from my grandmother, my aunt and my great aunt. So I have a connection to my past when I, when I see those and when I use those, it's, it's a nice connection. Mm -hmm. I don't have any uh, quilts from my family. Um, my grandmother's sisters quilted, but somebody else got those quilts. I have no idea. My grandmother sewed clothing and my mother did. And that's how I got into sewing um, at a very early age. I can remember still playing in the button box um, <laughs> before I could thread a needle and then sewing. And I ended up majoring in clothing and textiles in college. But back in those days, I didn't know that you could major in quilting or art quilting and design. And I, I wish I'd known that then, but um, I've always had a love of fabric and textiles. And uh, it's just it's just so rewarding playing with it. And um, I love seeing Joan's quilts from her dad. And I love the fact that she would finish them for him when he got on up in age. And um, they just hold such meaning. And they're just, they're treasures. They're keepsake treasures. Yeah, it's so fascinating. Well, thank you all so much. It's been a real treat talking with you guys. Uh, all of your all of your thoughts about your work are, are um, just really thoughtful and really refreshing. So thank you all so much for being here and spending the time with us today. Thank and you. I want to say a big thank you to the Delaplane for having us uh, and sharing your gallery with us. We, we appreciate it. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you, Kristen. <laughs> well, thank you all so much. And thanks to everybody who participated in our discussion today. While you're on our channel, check out our other videos and don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell to get notifications about other videos from the Delaplane. Thanks again for watching.